Good morning, Pastor Marshall here from Laby Baptist Church. Yes, we're still stuck, uh, had a bit of a cold, so a few other things have happened. We're not able to meet this morning, but however, we still have our teaching from Romans, the book of Romans, and I'm glad you can join us again today with our online church podcast. Our series at the moment is in the book of Romans, and it's a series that's pretty hard hitting. It's a pretty deep series. But at the same time, it's something that I believe that each one of us needs to understand. You don't hear Romans preached all that often. And sometimes you hear it preached in patches, but not the whole of it together. So the Apostle Paul, basically called the 13th Apostle, was one who, who, uh, who walked with Christ. We, we know that he was taught by Christ. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus when he was Saul. Um, and of course, at that point, was converted uh, to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and what we would probably know as Christianity. This series is a pretty deep series and it's, there's a lot in it. You've got to hang in there. But I know that there's many of you out there who want to know the deeper things of the scriptures. And so that's what we're going to do. If you're after a nice feel good, let's tickle your ears, froth and bubble sermon, uh, you probably need to tune into another podcast. This is a bit deeper. So for the next 30 minutes, it's going to be fairly heavy and it's a hard lesson. Paul says some pretty tough stuff. But he's only saying what the word of God is. So as I preach today, as I speak to you today, it's the word of God. It's what the Apostle Paul is teaching. So let's have a look at that. Let's pray quickly. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the rain you've given to us and your blessings. And Lord, we open our hearts now and our minds to your word as you want to teach us, helping us to become the true image of your son, Jesus, wanting us to grow, wanting us to deepen our faith and deepen our love for you and for others. So, Lord, teach us this morning, help us to sit by your word, to understand it fully by the grace of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 1, we looked at last week, we looked at the first 17 verses, and we looked at some of the things behind this letter, this uh, letter to the church, to the believers, to the Christians in Rome. It's a city that Paul never went to. One of the key verses as we look at it is verse 16 and 17. But 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, when you find the Apostle Paul and he goes to any new place on any of his missionary journeys, you find him going into the synagogue first. You always find him going to the Jew first and then to the Greek even though the Apostle Paul was the evangelist or, or the ministry to the, the Gentiles, we always see that he goes to the Jews first. He, he gives that respect first. He actually wants to explain the gospel first to those who are in the synagogue so that uh, they will understand it uh, just as well. But we know that his primary ministry is to the Gentiles. Who wrote the book of Romans? We know it was the Apostle Paul, but we also know that he had someone else who, who transcribed it for him, a guy called Tertius was his PA who, um, who uh, wrote most of these things down as Paul dictated them. You know, as I said, it's written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. It was a church that was never founded. It was never visited by the Apostle Paul at that point when he wrote this letter. But he's got a number of specific things that he wants to teach them. And so this week we're going to finish chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 18 to 32. The audience to whom he's writing, the Christians or the believers in Rome, it's a church, it's a brand new church made up of not only Gentile Christians, those who have come to faith in Jesus, but also Jews who have come to faith as believers in Jesus Christ as well. So you have Jews and Gentiles in this particular church in Rome. As I said, one of the key passages there is that I, Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel, but another key passage is um, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, that nothing can separate us from God's love through Jesus Christ. And so uh, that, that particular passage is my favourite verse in the Scriptures. It, it's an assurance of salvation. and It sort of asks this question, can anything separate us from God's love? And, you know, we know that Paul doesn't stop there in the book of Romans. He goes on to say that nothing in our present experience, nothing that's present or anything to come can separate us from God's love in Christ. That should be a, a tremendous encouragement to you, as it is for me, that nothing in all of time, whether it's past, present or future, can separate me from God's love in Jesus Christ. 
If we have a very quick look at the chapter summary, we did this last week, so I'm not going to uh, linger on this. Chapters 1 to 8 is about what to believe. Paul has his theology and he wants to explain that. Then he stops for a couple of chapters to explain God's relationship with Israel. Uh, but then he moves on from that right at the end for the last couple of chapters about how to behave. So there's the theology of righteousness, in other words, what to believe, God's righteousness in his relationship with Israel, and then we have the practice of righteousness in our normal day-to-day -day lives, how we should behave because of our knowledge, our acceptance and our decision uh, now that we are saved in Christ. As I said, Tertius was the, the uh, person who wrote Paul's writings down, probably when he was in Corinth and possibly in the winter of about AD 57 or 58. A very quick summary of the chapters are up there. There's all these big words like justification, sanctification, glorification. They simply just mean our past aspect, justification, just as if I'd never sinned. Sanctification, what God is doing in my life right now to grow me and mature me as a believer in Jesus. And then glorification, what God is going to do in the eternal in terms of the resurrection and glorification. Then you've got other things as well uh, there later on. We've got vindication and application, of course, as how do we apply what Paul's talking about in those last uh, three or four chapters. So we're going to talk about those things. Paul's going to explain those things as we go through this particular um, uh, book, this letter that he writes. And as I said, it's the only letter. It's very unique. It's the first time that systematic theology has been put in such a way. It's been organized and placed in um, these statements of faith, these statements of theology that Paul wants to teach this church in Rome. And it's the only letter to a church, as I said, that Paul does not found or hasn't visited up to this point. So he writes this letter. The, the church in Rome was never founded by an apostle. And so Paul believes that he has something to bring to them. Uh, it's a spiritual gift that he wants to give to them, but it's a mutual um, uh, learning process through which they both uh, will benefit. So let's have a look at the, the passage. Um, we, we learned last week that no one is saved just by simply living out the Christian life and not saying anything. Some people say, well, I don't have to preach the gospel. I just have to live the way I do and people have to pick that up, hopefully by observing or maybe by osmosis, who knows. But, and, you know, that's a good thing to do, to live your life in such a way. That's the minimum requirement. But no one's going to be saved unless the gospel is preached. And people can only be saved if they hear the content of the gospel. And the content of the gospel is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again. And so that's the content of the gospel. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. We know that's from the scriptures. And the gospel we know has to be proclaimed. So Paul wants to proclaim that, but he wants to encourage us to, uh, to understand that process as well. And so he, he talks about in Romans chapter 1, the latter half of Romans chapter 1, about uh, a process by which people should be able to observe through creation that there is a God. So we're going to look at that in just a minute. As I said, there's the content of the gospel. No one's ever going to be saved uh, by something else, just by looking at creation or whatever. You can't be saved just by that. The content of the gospel is Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the content of the gospel. All right, so Paul's going to... Uh, uh, talk about justification as we start this section of the, the, the book of Romans. But his whole content of this entire letter wants to talk to them about salvation. How does one get saved? And what's the process after that? What, what happens? And as I said, the past aspect was just as if I'd never sinned. Justification. God sees us when we decide uh, to accept Christ into our lives. God sees us as if, as if he's seeing Jesus himself. God doesn't see us. He sees what we have become in Christ. So that's the past aspect, justification. At present, what we're going through as believers right now, God is growing us. He's sanctifying us. He wants us to be in the image of the Son, His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we're growing into that image. And that's, that's the, uh, the Christian life. That's discipleship. That's maturing. That's growing. And then, of course, right at the end, he talks about the future which is glorification through the second resurrection or the resurrection of the dead. 
and those uh, are the bride of Christ. So we'll look at those, all of those things. Let's uh, just for a minute. When I was a young guy, I was explained when I was younger, the Roman road to salvation. Maybe you've never heard of it. You may be able to see it up on the screen. I've put a picture of a Roman road that we uh, walked on while we were over in the Middle East and, and over in Greece and Turkey. And they've got a number of passages on. And there's a number of passages there. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the, uh, the basis by which we need to be saved and we need a saviour. But then it says the wages of sin, because we have sinned, the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. But in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that he sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty, the price for sin. And then it mentions that we've got to confess with our mouth. Romans 10 verses 9 to 10, to confess with our mouth. And Romans 6 talks about being buried with Christ. Ultimately, Paul wants us to get to a point in Romans 12. He's explained all of these theological processes. And then he says in Romans 12, 1 to 2, brothers and sisters, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Take your every day walking around, going to sleep, eating, drinking, going to school and work and place it on the altar as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice uh, to me. That's the high point of what Paul's trying to get to at this as well. So he talks about the theology, but then he wants to talk about how you and I can be that living sacrifice. Okay. This section, the whole section is called the revelation of righteousness. What I want to do to you not to you, but with you, is read the, um, those chap chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. And my question for today that we're going to answer, and I hope this keeps you interested, is are people lost if they die without hearing the gospel? What, what do you think? If they've never heard the gospel, does that mean they're lost? Or does God have a special place in heaven for those who've never heard the gospel because it's not their fault? Paul's going to explain that through Romans chapter 1. Let's get to that in, in just a second. Let's read uh, this particular uh, section of Scripture. Last week we finished with this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is Paul, and he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. In verse 17 he says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. There's that passage from Habakkuk 2 verse 4 where he talks about that the righteous will live by faith. They've always done that, even in the Old Testament through to the New Testament. The righteous will live by faith. So let's have a look at verses 18 to 32. Let's read it together. I'll have it up on the screen behind me. You can follow on. You've got your version of your Bible, if you want to open it up and have a look at it as well. So let's, let's, let's read it through. It says, verse 18, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles and probably lots of other creepy crawly things as well. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26, Paul says, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with, one, with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Then Paul says in verse 28, he says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and their gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, boastful, 
They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. Wow, pretty heavy passage, isn't it? <clears throat> the revelation of righteousness. Let's, let's tuck into it right now. Let's have a look and see what Paul's trying to say to us. For many people, Romans is, is a really deep theological book, but I find that if we can explain it well, I'm going to go through it verse by verse, that you can hopefully understand it more clearly. And I hope that as we go through it, I can build or help you build on the foundation as we go through, that each week there'll be more things to learn and so we can build on that. So to be justified, what does that mean? Paul's still going to talk about justification, and it means to be declared righteous. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are righteous. It just means that God has now declared us to be righteous. And before we can really appreciate what being righteous is all about and what justification is all about, we've got to understand our position as sinners. Now, for many people, they don't want to be known as sinners at one of my previous churches, I had people come to me at times and say, please don't preach and tell me that I'm a sinner. Please don't preach on sin. And it was really interesting because how do you preach the gospel? How do we say that we need a saviour unless we understand that we're not only born into sin, we're conceived in sin? My sinful nature was conceived through my parents. And then through their parents, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where sin entered and actually changed the entire DNA of humanity at that time. So we're conceived into sin. Each one of us is a sinner. And you may or may not want to hear that, but that's the truth. And that's what Paul's teaching here. And unless we understand that we are sinners in God's sight, we'll never come to God for salvation. Why would we if we don't recognize that? And I think that's half the problem, is that our world doesn't understand sin or being a sinner. And that we need justification, that we need to be saved, we need a saviour. And so before we deal with this term of justification, Paul must deal with the issue of sin and show that regardless of where you might think your status is in human society, it doesn't matter because all, every single person is guilty of sin. And because every person, all are guilty of sin, all are under condemnation. Romans 3.23, it's part of that Roman road. The very first step into the Roman road is to recognize that everyone has fallen short. It's like shooting an arrow at a target and the arrow falls short. It's called hamatia, the hamatia of sin. And, and, and we fall short and we fall short of God's standard for our lives, short of righteousness. That everyone has fallen short of God's standard. So in chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, um, and then beyond, it goes all the way through to chapter 3, verse 20. Paul's going to deal with this issue of condemnation, of sin, of sinning. Uh, it's this universal need for righteousness because regardless of where you might think you stand in terms of your, your, your racial qualities, you, whether it's Jew or Gentile or, or religious qualities, where, where you stand in terms of, of those things or, or your social status, everyone has fallen short of God's standard of righteousness. And Paul wants to deal in this case, he deals with two. He deals with two particular main bodies. He, he talks first of all about the Gentiles, then he's going to talk about the Jews. So the guilt of the Gentiles is what, is what we're going to look at today. He begins it in verse 18 of chapter 1, but he goes all the way through till next week's message in uh, chapter 2 in verse 16. So we'll cover a bit more next week. But he understands that the Greeks defied humanity different than the Jews do. Jews divide it simply, um, Jews divide it simply between Jews and Gentiles. All right? Fairly simple. All right? But the Greeks divided between barbarians and cultured, or the Greeks, you know, they, they sense themselves as being the cultured ones of the world. But Paul's going to show that both of those whom the Greeks can consider barbarians are pagans and the cultured Greeks, they're both under God's condemnation. And he deals with this, this pagan barbarian uncultured in these verses that we're going to look at today, verses 18 to 32 of chapter 1. And then next week, we're going to have a look at verses 1 to 16 of chapter 2, and he's going to talk to the cultured or the refined Gentiles, the Greeks. So verse 18 to 20, he shows that there has been 
uh, to creation and through creation a revelation of the knowledge of God. I mean, what do you see when you look at creation? Oh no, it was just a big bang. It all happened by chance. Things piled on top of one another. We, we jumped out of the primordial, primordial uh, slop or soup and things just started to happen. I, grow, I grew up, you know, all those sorts of things. But, but when we look at creation, what do we see? I go out at night and the sky has been amazing the last couple of nights. Just to see the stars, the, the Milky Way, the things that are up there, that someone has actually done that. It hasn't happened by chance. And so through creation, there is this um, understanding. There's this, been this revelation of God to some degree, that there is a, this knowledge, there's this knowledge of God. And in verse 18, he, the point he wants to make is that the, the, the wrath of God and the need for a gospel of grace arises from this wrath that has been revealed. We'll get more to that in a second. But the righteousness of God is revealed because the wrath of God is revealed. It's a wrath where God shows his displeasure with ungodliness and with sin as we've developed as mankind. Now, the word godlessness or ungodliness, it means an irreverence, an irreverence of God in a religious sense. And Romans 1.20 says this, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So he's talking about this ungodliness that has crept in. And, and this word ungodliness talks about God's wrath or the need, this need for this grace gospel, but irreverence of God in a very religious sense. So it means to disregard that God exists. And to keep on living your life as if he doesn't exist. We see that in our world today. So many live that way. Humanity has had this tendency to live as if God just does not exist. Against this kind of ungodliness, the wrath of God is revealed. God, not happy that we don't recognize his handiwork, his creation. We've been given the evidence. And while ungodliness is a failure or an irreverence in the religious sphere, the term unrighteousness is a failure in the moral sphere. So God's wrath is revealed against both in the ungodliness or the religious sphere and then also in the unrighteousness of mankind, which is the moral sphere. In other words, the things that we've done to one another, the sin that we've committed. Now, barbarianism or paganism is guilty of hindering that knowledge of God or holding the truth in unrighteousness. So it's not that the pagan world is totally without some sort of revelation of who God is. The nature of this revelation we'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, in terms of Paul, he's saying that unbelievers or paganism or barbarianism, they can know certain things about God because there's a degree of revelation available to them. But Paul says that they actually suppress that. They hold back the truth. They possess the truth, but they suppress it by their unrighteous living. So the truth that they're able to possess, whatever amount that they, that may be or how limited that may be, they possess it unrighteously. Now, he talks about that in verse 18, but he goes on to explain it and how, what he means in verse 19. And there are things that can be known about God, even by the pagan world, who have no copy of the scriptures. There is that which can be known. And, you know, the difficulty here is not about that they're, they're ignorant, but the difficulty is that they've rejected it or suppressed it. Now, all men have the image of God in them, and to some degree, all men have a sense of guilt. We have a conscience, we have a sense of guilt. And according to verse 20, all men have an adequate amount of knowledge to know something about God. And so there's this suppression, even though we've, we can see all around us the evidence and what we see around us is the, the, the visible evidence of the invisible God. And what happens is we have this suppression of the truth about who God is because we want to live our own way. But according to verse 20, Paul says, all men have an adequate amount of knowledge to know something about God. So what is it that they can clearly know from this general revelation, the stuff that they see around them, apart from not having the scriptures. If you didn't have the scriptures, if you lived in the deepest, darkest place, what are these things that Paul's talking about, this general revelation? But what he says is that the visible things are the evidence of the invisible. I said that a minute ago. The fact that the world exists, the fact that the pagan person can look around them and know that the world exists. When he looks up, he sees stars in the heavens. He sees that the moon is there or the sun. They exist and that these things should have been enough to tell him two things about God. 
The two things that, those should have, that should be evident through that is that this God must be very powerful, his eternal power, to be able to make these sorts of things like the universe and celestial bodies and stars and moon and whatever. And the second thing is about his divinity, that he is, to some ex extent, the pagan can know that this person is powerful and that he exists, that he is God. So just from general revelation, the pagan person, the barbarian, as Paul says, should be able to conclude that there's two things, that there is a God that exists and that this God is extremely powerful. And the purpose why there is general revelation available to all men apart from the special revelation that we get through through the Bible, through the scriptures, is that he says that all men may be without excuse in verse 20. We said that a minute ago. So the principle that, that Paul's trying to get to here is that uh, if man truly responds to the light that he has, this revelation of God, that God will actually give him and bring him more light. Now, general revelation is not enough to save anyone. Why? How does one get saved? There's no other name under heaven except the name of Jesus that man can be saved. And so the content of the gospel is still Jesus Christ. Because that which saves is the content of the gospel. Jesus, who died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. So one must have a knowledge of that fact in order to be saved. But the pagan world could have known two basic things about God. And had they lived up to that knowledge, they could have from general revelation, God would have seen to it that they would have got more light. And, you know, have a think about this. And that's why we see, you know, even in our own lives, there's been times where we've done mission trips. But as I look at uh, and I read about different missionaries down through time, through history and in the last couple of centuries, but we also look at those that we support as missionaries, there's this deep desire they suddenly get a deep burden for a, a way out tribe or somewhere in deepest, darkest Africa or South America. And they'll do anything that they can to actually take the gospel to this grouping of people. They sell up everything. They, they forgo everything to go over there and to actually share the gospel because God has instilled that burden upon their heart. And there are people out there, no matter how far that they might be from civilization, there are people out there who would respond to the light if they were only given it. And God will make sure that the gospel is presented and that more light is given and presented. But God also knows when there will be no response whatsoever. And so we see this, this, this concept of why people sell up everything and go and share the gospel because of this particular verse in Romans, where it says that God will actually display or give more light into the hearts and minds of those who seek it. But how do they seek it? How do they hear it? Only if someone goes. So we'll come to the question for today. Um, the question, that, and I had it up on the screen a little while ago. It, it, it asked a question. I'm just scrolling through some of these that I've already mentioned. Um, that if man truly responds to the light that he has, God will give him more light. So we know, as I said, general revelation, not enough to save. The content of the gospel is Jesus, buried, rose again, etc. And here's my question for today. And hopefully this will keep you interested today because it's a long session. But hey... We want to know, are people lost if they die without hearing the gospel? What would you say? You know, is it fair that if people haven't heard the gospel that they would go to hell? Is that fair? Let's, let's see what Paul says. Today's question, are people lost if they die? And Paul's answer is yes. And according to Paul, and he wants to develop all this, this in this passage, Pagans are still lost if they die without ever hearing the gospel. Because if a man can be saved by purely never hearing the gospel, the worst thing that we could do as the Western world is send the missionary to them. They get to hear the gospel and they get this opportunity to reject it and then they would go to hell. Why give them the chance to reject the gospel and end up in hell? Particularly if you can get to heaven simply just by not hearing the gospel ever in your life. Why would we, as a Western society, Christian society, send people out to give them that chance to reject uh, the gospel? And under that premise, the worst thing that we can ever do is, is to give them a gospel. But if we understand the basic fact that all men are lost because they've rejected this general revelation of God around them, then we can see the need for getting the gospel out to them. Verse 21 to 23, Paul spells out the fact that uh, 
They've rejected all of this knowledge to them. For they knew God, but they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. Their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, and yet they became fools, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, birds, reptiles, and animals. And in verse 21, Paul starts to spell out what the barbarians and the pagans fail to do. They fail to learn from the knowledge that was available to them. Failure to learn from them, they developed a series of steps, and here they are, the seven, seven steps. And Paul says this is what they developed. Number one was recognizing, uh, or sorry, that should read not recognizing um, that there was a God. So that's what they failed to do, to recognize that there was a God. They didn't glorify him as God. That was the first step in their, their degeneration uh, um, as pagans. They, then number two, they failed to give him thanks for what God has provided to them through their common grace that they've received. And step number three, they became vain then in their reasonings. Their reasonings became detrimental, perverse, self-willed, self-centered, self-satisfying. Uh, and the fourth step is what corrupted the mind now moved into their heart their senseless heart was darkened as a result of these reasonings that they made in their mind. There is no God. I can get away with anything. I can do whatever. There's no God. There's no judgment. There's nothing. And so um, that's moved then to their heart. And so out of the heart, they do all of these, these things. Step five is professing to be wise, their own wisdom, they actually become fools. In step six, we see in verse uh, 23, we've got a sixth step. Since it was obvious that they couldn't remove the light, it's all around them. They've got God's creation all around them. They couldn't remove it, but because general revelation is always available to them, to them they began to change the object of that that they became responsible to. In other words, they didn't want to be responsible to this creator God who is somewhere out there, but they have decided that there was no God so they could learn uh, through general revelation. They, they didn't want to know that. And so they tried to change the object of that which they were responsible to. So they started to make their own images. And step seven tells us what that change was. It led to changing the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of images of corruptible men or birds or animals or beasts or creepy things or lizards or whatever. In other words, they actually degenerated into idolatry. And rather than worshipping that which we could see from general re revelation, God the creator, they began to make images of that which they see. Things that naturally die and corrupt and fade away anyway. And they made images of men. They made images of animals. They made images of all sorts of things and called these images gods. And they began to worship these gods. Now, as you look at the pagan uh, history, it's a common element is idolatry and this shows that it was a progressive degeneration that led them to it they became idolaters not out of their ignorance but because they rejected and suppressed the knowledge which was available to them as pagans uh, from general revelation so what was the result what are the results of them um, rejecting God Paul goes on to say in the next couple of verses from verse 24 onwards to the end of chapter 1. And he talks in terms of, uh, he spells out what the results were because of their rejection. And three different times, he's going to emphasize that God gave them up to something. The first one, he starts in this passage about therefore or wherefore. It's a connecting word and it introduces a specific result that comes from what he's just said. And the first result is that God gave them up in the love for the lusts in their hearts to uncleanness, to vile and shameful passions as well. And because they rejected the knowledge, God simply gave them up. An expression to give up here is used in this judicial sense. It means, well, it doesn't mean that God merely permitted them to go their own way. And it doesn't mean that God merely withdrew his gracious aid from them. But there was this judgment. There's this judicial uh, judgment by God. And God gave them up as an appropriate punishment for their rejection of the knowledge available to them. And as a rejection, it, it led in the first stage of degeneration to promiscuity. There is no rules. We can get away and do with whatever we want. We don't care. It's, we don't believe in God. And so promiscuity came along. And that was the logical result when they began to worship that which was created through idolatry rather than the creator himself. And it was a means to exchange the truth that was available to them about God and to change that truth now into a lie. 
And the second result is that uh, he says God gives them up uh, into their vile and shameful passions and lusts. He talks about, you know, women exchanging sexual relationships, their natural sexual relationships for unnatural ones. And he talks the same for men. And so the second result, Paul says, was that God gave them up for their vile passions and that leads them into these pathways down to homosexuality and lesbianism. So we first move to promiscuity, which is in the heterosexual area. Uh, and when that degenerates further, we then move into this, uh, this natural being given up for the unnatural. Women with women, men with men, burning in passion for one another receiving in themselves, as Paul puts it, the due recompense or penalty of their error. After a period of this goes on, there's a third stage. And Paul says there's a third result which uh, he deals with in these verses, verses 28 to 32. And for a third time, God gives them up to a depraved mind to do those things which are just not fitting. And finally, gives them, uh, God gives them up totally to a depraved mind. There's 21 things. He lists, Paul lists 21 things that are not fitting, that actually come with this depraved mind. They know the ordinance of God, those, that those who do such things are worthy of death, and yet they continue to do them anyway, and they encourage others to do it as well. And so that's the state of, you know, you've heard the word hedonism or, you know, doing um, things that we want to in our natural um, that's the pagan world. And Paul's describing this now, and he's talking about not only what they did, but the result of it and that pathway. But then he's going to, um, let's just summarize a little bit of, of you know, what, we've, what we've said. And Romans 1.28 says, Since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind. I don't know about you, but you know, have a look at this sign here. I bet hell is fabulous. You know, the scriptures actually teach that hell is the, the most darkest separate most separate place away from God that you won't be able to see your fingers in front of your face that as you um, as you're in hell that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and you won't see anyone you might think you're going there and having a good time with your mates but let me tell you the scriptures paint exactly the opposite picture it will be a place of of uh, of sheer uh, terror sheer hell you will hear the screams you won't see anyone but let's sum summarize it because what Paul wants to do is he wants to show us a number of things. The pagan world had four things um, that they had. And Paul wants to, to, to tell us this. He said they had a degree of knowledge revealed to them. They knew the truth through the experiences of the things around them. They knew that they were um, rejecting that knowledge. They had rejected it and they understood the results of that rejection. So that were the four things uh, that Paul tells us what the pagan world had. Now, in their rejection of the truth, we're told, or Paul tells us, that they did three things. They changed the glory of God into idolatry. They changed the truth of God now into a lie. And they gave up the knowledge of God after evaluating it. So out of this passage, we can draw a couple of principles. And uh, God's dealings with nations and why nations actually get to a position where God actually simply gives them up. And I'm sure as you think about some of those nations around the world, why has God given up on some nations? But the progression in light of these verses goes something like this. I've put it up on the screen. The first step in the progression is that man begins to lower God into his own image. That whenever you reject a proper knowledge of God, you begin to lose your proper concept of God. You begin to lower God down to your standards, down to your image, down to your thoughts and processes. And that's what man began to do. That's step one. Step two, this will lead to sexual promiscuity or immorality preoccupation with sexual things and that's in a heterosexual sense and if that's not abated at some point it leads eventually then to the third stage which takes us from the normal in the sexual world and promiscuity in the heterosexual world to the abnormal and then the fourth step is God finally gives them up totally he gives up on them totally and there's some sort of judgment or fall that will come now in light of all the modern current events as we see around the world, we could ask this question, where is our country in this four-step progression? We can see possibly what stage we're at and we can possibly see which stage we're quickly moving toward. That promiscuity has taken over most lives in the natural leading into the unnatural. 
So ask ourselves the question, how do we see our country? And does that disturb us? So let's have a look at a quick application, then we'll finish. What lessons can we draw from uh, the teaching that Paul has given us so far? Number one, we can learn that there is enough knowledge available in nature for appreciation and gratitude of who God is, that general revelation that there is a God that he has created the sun, moon and stars and the earth, the planets and us. The second thing that we can look at in terms of application is in spite of all of secular anthropology, the study of mankind, that man's religious evolution is not upward. In fact, it's downward. You think about when um, Noah jumped off the ark, there was one God. They were a monotheistic one God, monotheism. One God, there was one God. And all of a sudden, over a period of time, they've gone and worshipped their own gods. They've moved from monotheistic to polytheistic. And so instead of being this upward evolution, it's downward. The order has been in reverse. Man is moving from monotheism to polytheism. The third application that we, 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 we look at here is that God will punish sin. Sometimes he punishes sin by allowing greater sin to enter into a person or a nation or a community's life. And so that's an interesting uh, application as we look at how God will punish sin. Sometimes he gives, it, gives us up to that sin, which leads to worse scenario. The fourth application that we can look at here is even the most degraded uh, of men. And this, this is important if we actually want to have a proper concept of missions and uh, uh, sending missionaries, is that even the most degraded of men still have a knowledge of God because every man has a conscience that bears witness to the general revelation of who God is. We'll talk more about that in chapter 2. That's next week. The fifth application is that knowledge by itself doesn't keep anyone from committing sins worthy of judgment and death. You can know all of this stuff and still commit the sins that are worthy of judgment and death, as Paul talks about. Knowledge doesn't necessarily create a hatred for sin. So they're the five things of application as we've, we come to an end of this first chapter of Romans. And it's deep, it's heavy, and I hope you know that you'll stay tuned to us over the next period of time so we can learn more. We've talked about the Gentiles next week. We're going to have a chat about the Jews as well. And we're going to have, have more of a, a chat about some of these, these concepts as they apply not only to uh, the barbarians and the pagans, but also to the cultured Greeks and then also later to the Jews. So let's, uh, let's leave it there for today. And I know that um, maybe some of these things have been speaking into your heart to see that process of degradation of humanity. Maybe tonight you'll stand outside and have a look at the stars and you'll just sit there and thank God for who he is and what he has done, that you'll appreciate him. I know my wife and I, whenever we uh, have a meal together, we hold hands, well, we hold each other and we say grace and we're, we're thankful for what God has provided into our lives. And it's this knowledge that there is a creator God. There's someone greater than us. Next week, obviously, your homework. We want to have a look at Romans chapter 2. So we're going to have a look at God's righteous judgment again next week. Um, so if you've got time, have a look at Romans chapter 2. And of course, don't forget to tune into our YouTube channel uh, for more of these podcasts. Next week, Romans 2. Let's, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, our mighty Father God. We thank you that you give us the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into our lives. We thank you for your revelation of who you are in the heavens and through all of creation around us. That you show us your great power that you show us your greatness and we recognize our inability to live up to your righteousness and our constant battle each day with sin in our lives. We want to do the right thing, but we can't. And so, Father, just give us a fresh understanding today from your word to help us in that battle that you've provided a solution for our sin through the cross, through Jesus Christ. He took our sin to the cross so that we might receive the gift of eternal salvation. Father, just continue to teach us through this letter to the, the Roman church. Teach us and convict us, mold us and change us as we come further into the light that you have for us. And we pray today, Father, that all men, whether Jew or Gentile, will hear the call of the gospel, that they too will walk towards the light of Christ. Today we think of our own missionaries uh, in uh, uh, faraway lands,
thanking you, Lord, that you have put upon their heart to take the light of the gospel of Jesus to places that you have deemed them to go. We pray your blessing to be upon your people everywhere now around the world, whether it be here in our little community or anywhere around the world. We think of those today in Beirut in Lebanon and we pray for them and for their salvation, but for their protection and for their restitution. We pray for the work of your Holy Spirit to convict mankind's hearts before it's too late. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your nation Israel and we pray for her today. Lord, we pray that you would give her courage in these times. Lord, that you'd encourage her to be a light to all nations. So, Father, we finish today by asking that you would give to each of us the courage to live out the way of Christ in these uncertain times and to show us in every situation that Jesus is the answer. We look forward to his triumphant return for the bride, for his people. So, Father, as we, as we step into this series in Romans, convict us. Convict us to remain pure and ready as your bride. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So thanks for tuning in to us again today. Uh, you know, we've got great teaching there. We've had a series in Zechariah. We'll continue with uh, the book of Romans over the next number of weeks. So thanks for joining us. We hope you can stay with us. Jump onto our website. It's going to appear down the bottom of the screen. You can see lots of great stuff. I was talking to a mate of mine this week about he's scared of dying and I've given him a, a, um, pointed him to our website to have a look at a few diagrams that we've got there. So keep liking and following us and, um, you know, hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Uh, it's free to subscribe. Jump in, learn more stuff about the scriptures. Uh, make sure that you know what's going on in the world around you. So thanks for joining us. This is Pastor Marshall signing off for today. Thanks for joining us. I'd love to see you again next week, same time, same place, next week. Bye for now.